Hi, my name is Mark Collier, and I'm the COO of the OpenStack Foundation, Sparky Collier on Twitter, if you're into that. And I would like to tell you all about OpenStack today. Hopefully you already have heard of it and you know some things about it, but I thought I'd give you a quick overview of what the software and the community are all about, and also dive into the foundation we've recently established and really try to give you a sense for how the foundation's structured and what the mission is and how you might get involved if you are interested in being part of the foundation um, in some way and helping to shape the future of OpenStack. So OpenStack is cloud software. It's really uh, many different things. It is a community of many thousands of participants, both users and developers and business folks who are thinking about how they can solve business problems with OpenStack. And it is, of course, code, which, which is the, 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 the basis of the software. And when we think about what problems OpenStack is trying to solve, um, the easiest way we've found to describe it is to call it a cloud operating system. And the reason we use this term is uh, if you think about an operating system in a traditional sense on a single machine, whether it's a server or a laptop, it's really kind of there to keep track of all the resources that you're trying to uh, access, whether it's the storage or the computing resources and so forth. Uh, or the network, which is uh, something you're trying to manage. And when you think about putting together a large pool of resources, for example, many thousands of servers in a data center, you really want to get to a point of automation and orchestration where you can keep track of all of those different resources, the physical as well as the virtual, as you virtualize, uh, for example, a server with a hypervisor, uh, you want to be able to look across all of those different uh, machines and, and understand where all the work's getting done and really abstract away a lot of the, the hassle of managing a lot of, a lot of equipment by abstracting that, by having this um, cloud framework that takes a look at, at all those different uh, resources and, and pools, both compute, networking, and storage, and oftentimes, of course, in combination. And the way that you would interact with a system like this, once you've used uh, software to really kind of automate your data center is through either applications of your own that might talk to the APIs or a set of tools you may use. So you, there are many management tools, for example, like RightScale and Stratus and others that work with the OpenStack API and give you um, another level of, um, of insight into what's happening in your cloud and managing your workloads as you want to move them um, in and out of this cloud or other OpenStack clouds, etc. Um, and so you may see, for example, a spike in traffic to your website and, you know, you get that monitoring alert and your, your uh, system is able to auto scale by talking to those APIs and provisioning more resources. So that's just a very basic explanation of, of where OpenStack sits in your data center. Um, but another way that people frequently engage with it is through the dashboard. So there's a web dashboard, the OpenStack dashboard that, um, you know, has both an administrative view as well as an end user view. So as an end user, similar to engaging with any cloud out there that you may have used, um, you can log in, you can um, provision different resources, you can spin up a virtual machine, for example, of different sizes, four gigs, eight gigs, whatever flavors your particular OpenStack cloud is, is um, configured to support. And the administrative view, on the other hand, is actually you know, a higher level admin uh, perspective on that OpenStack cloud where you actually define things like the number of flavors. So whether there's a four gigabyte instance that has a certain amount of storage attached to it, all those different allotments that kind of customize the cloud to the users you're trying to target, those are all controlled through the administrative view on the dashboard. And this is really just a, a kind of a bulleted list to give you some examples of, you know, what the capabilities are within OpenStack. And, you know, the compute, um, is really kind of the most self-evident when you think of cloud computing, you think of computing, and that's exactly what this is. It's provisioning, you know, pools of resources, typically a virtual machine that's like a physical server in, in the way it behaves, but it's actually, you know, virtualized. And then uh, from a storage perspective, we support both object storage and block storage. Um, object storage is really meant for very large quantities of data that you want to reliably store, typically at very low cost. Um, not as common for a performance um, you know, application, although oftentimes it's paired with a CDN, 
um, in a public cloud setting where uh, you can push objects to a CDN to get that performance you're looking for, for example, images and so forth uh, that you might have uh, large libraries of stored in an object store, but you want to give performance uh, to a web client and, and then you would use a CDN. Um, block storage, of course, is uh, very traditional uh, storage. It's been around quite a while as a, as a format, but um, there are a lot of different ways you can do block storage and OpenStack Compute has always supported block storage, but recently um, it's really been broken out as a separate project or separate effort with a dedicated team, uh, primarily to bring um, more innovation, and faster innovation to, to play by having a team of, of subject matter experts, domain experts from across the storage industry and one of the core tenets of OpenStack is it's very pluggable. It's designed to work with the systems that you want to plug in. So it's not overly prescriptive about a specific type of, of technology, whether it's on the hypervisor side where with the compute, you can choose to plug in different hypervisors. Or in this case, with block storage, it works with NetApp, SolidFire, Nexenta. And actually, just in the last few days, um, EMC announced that they are now a sponsor of the OpenStack Foundation. So. When you look at, at the, the who's who of, of storage out there, there's certainly many ways you can do it. And the OpenStack philosophy is however you want to do it, you know, OpenStack can be that engine in the middle. And through that, that philosophy of being vendor neutral and being um, a, a pluggable architecture, we have these drivers now uh, from a lot of these different companies that are active in the community. And that's it's really a great testament to kind of the early architectural philosophy paying off. You know, networking is no no uh, exception. Um, the networking uh, capability within OpenStack, OpenStack networking really is designed to let you plug in um, the networking technology of choice. Now, of course, the flavor everybody's talking about these days is SDN or Software Defined Networking. And some of the leaders in Software Defined Networking have actually been creating this portion of OpenStack. Um, so, you know, it's very well uh architected and with that in mind so that if you want to be really um, out there on the cutting edge and you want to uh, really let software take over your data center, well, the networking is kind of the final frontier in many ways. And um, you can certainly do that with SDN, although uh, because it's pluggable, again, it gives you a lot of choices. You could certainly um, use the, the networking capabilities and, and talk to a more traditional network layout with physical gear it doesn't require to use SDN, but that is one of the things that's kind of driving this pluggable capability that, that was recently um, added in the Folsom release um, a few months ago. Um, I talked about a little bit about the dashboard, the different roles. Last but not least, the shared services, really. Um, there's a couple of examples here. So there's a multi-tenant authentication system, and that's really important because when we so first started to kind of pull together a lot of these different components into one cloud operating system, if you will, we realized that one of the things you want in common is authentication. You don't want to have your users logging into the storage system uh, discreetly from the compute system. And particularly um, in an example of the image service, uh, whereby you want to have a library of images and you want to be able to keep track of those, whether it's your favorite fa flavor of Linux or if it's the LAMP stack or some you know, some uh, whole library of images you may have that when brought together uh, uh, constitute, you know, your whole app architecture and you may use, you know, Chef or Puppet or, or what have you. But um, when you think about the images being, let's say, stored on the object storage and, of course, you're going to uh, move those into the compute uh, service or into the block storage service when you want to actually go into production with it, you know, having it all working together seamlessly with one authentication system is a requirement we saw early on and, and so that's part of what we call the shared services. Now the open development process is one that is really interesting. I think it's extremely important to how OpenStack has uh, come so far so fast and it's something we're very committed to. Um, the process itself as well as the fact that it's open, you know, those are those are kind of um, two important points. Um, first of all, we release new software every six months. Um, there are also milestones along the way. So, you know, you might think of those as a point release or kind of an interim release. But, but in, in reality, what happens is that uh, kind of as soon as we're done with one release, um, we have a design summit a couple of weeks later, usually somewhere in the world where we're, all the people who are used to working over IRC and mailing lists and over the phone and talking online in various uh, ways throughout the year actually get together in person. Very important to to get to meet um, the rest of the people in the community, as many as we can possibly 
you know, get to these summits and plan out that next release. And so what ends up happening is they really start kind of working on the next version right after the summit. And you end up with these milestones kind of periodically along the way. But most users tend to gravitate towards the big releases every six months. And then, of course, those um, are uh, upstream to a number of Linux distributions. So all the major Linux distributions now support OpenStack. And I think that's, that's a fantastic um, testament to all the excitement and the contributions that are coming in from those companies and those communities. Uh, really is, is a, has a lot to do with the momentum we've seen in OpenStack, and we, we're just going to be more excited about that. Um, and, and to that end, you know, we've had over 600 contributors um, who've actually contributed code to the project and, and made the software what it is today. If you want to become a contributor, um, any time you're looking for information, the wiki is always a good starting point. But there's a wiki.openstore, uh, excuse me, wiki.openstack.org slash how to contribute if you want to check that out. Um, when you look at the community, um, you know, it's hard to put numbers on a community and I think it's easy to, to, you know, um, lose sight of, of really where the passion is in the community and what's really driving it. If you, if you spend too much time looking at the numbers, but you know, the ecosystem, the number of companies that are involved in OpenStack is, is something we, we set out early on to pursue. I mean, we wanted to see a lot of companies investing in OpenStack and so, you know, one way to measure that is just how many companies are there. Um, but at the end of the day, what really matters is what are they doing? Are they active? Are they investing? Are they hiring? And so, you know, very happy to see that they're certainly bringing in um, a lot of people to our summits. And so you'll notice, you know, the, the pattern is quite similar between the number of companies getting involved and the amount of people that are coming to the summits. We started with 75 people in Austin about two and a half years ago. And in San Diego, just back in October, we had uh, 1,300 plus. Pretty amazing growth. Um, and really, again, the graphs kind of don't do it justice when you, I really encourage anyone who's interested in OpenStack, please try to make it to a summit. Um, it's such an amazing experience. Um, everybody there is invited to be a contributor. Everyone, I hope, feels like a contributor and it's a welcoming environment. And you know, we try to define contributor, you know, in a, in a broad way or define the community in a broad way. And we talk about the, the foundation mission in a minute to that end. But, um, you know, the number of, of developers kind of on a rolling 30 day basis um, over the last couple of years has continued to grow. And so, again, as we think about more companies getting involved, more people coming to the summit, is that leading to more development activity and certainly looks like all the, the trends are heading in the right direction. Um, and then, you know, another data point that uh, is worth looking at is just how much software is being written. Um, this is obviously just one aspect of how to look at, at the growth of the community. But if you think back to the very early um, uh, origins of this project, I mean, we had a object storage system, which was, you know, um, really had just kind of gone into production. So it was, it was reliable, but it you know was at the beginning of kind of its uh, uh, capability to go into a much broader set of installations from just one company and and putting that out there where new use cases could emerge and um, the reliability could continue to improve. And then on the compute side, you know we had an amazing um, we were amazingly fortunate actually just before launching OpenStack to connect with the folks at uh, NASA who were building uh, this Nova project, the compute project, and had already made a lot of progress, had a, a, a viable prototype that was working that we could see and look at the architecture and determine, wow, this is going to really accelerate OpenStack instead of kind of starting from square one. And so going from those humble beginnings to where we are today, it's, it's amazing, you know, that 90% of the code that we think of as OpenStack today didn't exist two years ago. And yet, you know, we did have um, have an inkling of, of something at the beginning there, a spark that really set everything in motion. And, you know, at the end of the day, all of the code in the world is kind of useless if you don't have users, right? So we love our users. We have a ton of them. They're starting to really come out of their shell and talk about what they've been doing, which is something that we're excited about. So we've had a um, gentleman from Cisco WebEx keynote our last summit. And when you hear about, you know, something as large as WebEx, who we've all, you know, we've all used, I'm sure, 
um, throughout our, our careers, you know, running on OpenStack, relying on that in production. It's very, very exciting. And, you know, I think one of our biggest priorities as a community needs to be to, to really put these users on a pedestal, listen to them, make sure that we're um, thinking as a community about how we respond to their needs so that this list continues to grow. And, you know, they feel empowered and they feel like they're a big part of this community because they absolutely are. Um, you know, other names like PayPal, you know, probably familiar with um, eBay. I mean, these are some incredible leaders in the technology industry um, that are that are really um, making big bets on OpenStack. And we can be more excited to to have them be part of the community. You know, the international um, aspect of OpenStack has just blown me away from the very, very beginning. I mean, shortly after we launched OpenStack, we went to Japan and there was a, a you know, Japan OpenStack user group meetup that had um, hundreds of people just standing room only. And we had, we had just sort of lit that fuse, you know, a couple months earlier saying, OpenStack, is this an idea people are interested in? And it's just grown from there. Um, if you look at some of these pictures, these are from user groups all over the world. Um, there was a simultaneous celebration when the foundation launched. A lot of people were excited. And uh, of course, I couldn't be there in every one of those, given they were simultaneous. But I would very much like over the next couple of years to visit as many of the countries with user groups as, as I can, because uh, I love the excitement. There's really nothing like it. Um, you can certainly see that uh, there was a lot of excited people in this in this particular event uh, about the foundation. So, you know, if 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 there's that much energy in the room, you know, count me in. I'll be I'll be there. So, um, talked a lot about OpenStack and and the beginnings of it. I, I think you know I don't want to uh, spend too much time on the foundation because there's a lot of information out there about it. But I'm happy to kind of explain you know what it's about and and why we're why we started it. Uh, maybe help you figure out how to get involved. So. The foundation is an independent body, meaning it's a nonprofit, a separate entity. It's not controlled by, you know, a particular company. It's not a subsidiary or anything like that. It's, it's a truly independent nonprofit um, entity, and um, it makes sense, I think, to have a foundation because of a project that's as important as OpenStack. We want it to remain open. So when we think about protecting, empowering, and promoting OpenStack. You know, protecting means sort of making sure that it continues to be open, that we have the resources we need to uh, make sure it, it lives on for many, many years as the, as the, the different um, players who want to contribute or consume it, um, you know, ebb and flow and, and new people come in. We want to have kind of a, a group that can help facilitate all that and protect it and make sure that it lives for many, many years and continues to grow. You know, empowering is all about the fact that when you look back at those user groups, I mean, there's you know hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of people in all these user groups globally. And as a foundation, I mean, we have eight people a day. We'll probably have 12 staff, you know, by early next year, and that's that's about as big as we're going to get. So, you know, we're obviously not here to to do everything. We're here to empower uh, as many people in the community to take charge of the OpenStack mission and run with it and define it and take it in in the the direction that you want it to go and we're just here to help um, as, as the foundation staff and you know promoting OpenStack is something we as a foundation are uh, are equipped to do and we have done in the past and we're, we're going to continue to do and last but not least I just point out that you know we talk about you know what we're protecting empowering promoting it's the community um, all around it you know users developers the entire ecosystem we're, we have a very inclusive culture. I think that's extremely important. You know, um, we never want to, you know, overly narrowly define, you know, what it means to, to be part of the community, because if you're a user, certainly uh, you may not contribute code or patches. You, some do, some don't. But um, at the end of the day, you know, we're all here fighting for the users. So we want to hear from you and want you to feel like you're a, a big part of the community. And this is, just really speaks to the approach we took when we were creating the foundation, you know, creating the bylaws, creating a lot of the structures that ultimately became this legal entity. And a lot of it was about preserving the OpenStack way. So in other words, we weren't trying to solve some big problem that we, that we saw in the community or in the way OpenStack was, was being managed. We were trying to really kind of take it to its permanent home 
uh, and not do too much damage along the way. So some of those, those key tenets, I think, are technical people making technical decisions based on merit. Seems like common sense, right? Um, I think it is, but uh, you know, it, it, it bears um, enshrining in the bylaws as it is. And you know, when I give you a little more uh, background on how the technical committee works and the, the project technical leads, I mean, it's all based on this idea that if you work hard and you present um, the best idea, the best idea wins, and that's how the technical direction of this project is determined. And we, we really believe in that, and that's a core tenet um, having dedicated resources that can do community building activities, can help throw these design summits, bring people together, help court more people into this ecosystem who can invest in it and make money on it. I mean, that is something we've done historically. We want to continue to do that. And that's part of what the foundation, um, you know, is staffed to do and resource to do. And again, you know, encouraging, rewarding contributions in all forms. Um, you know, that's definitely key. So in terms of membership and how it's actually structured, there are three types of members. There's individual members. It's pretty self-evident. It's individuals. It's you and I. It's everyone in the community, regardless of you know, who you work for or don't work for or, or uh, you know, what particular role you have, whether you're a developer or a marketer or a user. Um, however you're involved in OpenStack, if it's important to you, you should join because by being part of the, this um, foundation, you can help chart the future of it. And you have a lot of rights and responsibilities that go along with that. I mean, a big one is voting. I'll talk a little bit about the, the upcoming election in a second. But, you know, it, it's just a, it's a way to really be uh, officially part of the foundation is to join. So openstack.org slash join. Pretty straightforward. Um, the platinum and gold members are really organizations that are providing the bulk of the funding and other forms of support to help the, make the foundation a reality. So the platinum members, in addition to providing substantial funding, are also required uh, to have a commitment to having full-time employees that are doing nothing but working on OpenStack, whether it's developers or you know, community um, leadership, other types of roles. As long as they're you know, really dedicated to advancing OpenStack, then that's an you know, indication they're really committed to, to the future of OpenStack in addition to just cutting a check to make it financially possible to have a foundation. And then the platinum members appoint uh, each appoint a director to the board of directors. And then the gold members amongst um, a larger group of, of these companies will elect uh, members to the board. And so it's uh, set up so that it's a third, third, third. So in other words, there's eight seats on the board that are elected by the individual members, eight uh, appointed by the platinum members and eight elected by the gold members. So that's that's basically how we try to keep things balanced um, and how it's structured. This is a list of all of the current platinum and gold members. Now things are growing very fast so by the time you see this we might even have other gold members but um, it is exciting to see some of these names. I mean some of the the biggest leaders in open source who who've pioneered um, in the Linux uh, world and some of the companies that have domain expertise around networking. I mean, we're trying to advance the state of the art in networking, as I mentioned earlier, through the OpenStack Networking Project and having some of the, the four most leaders in networking, you know, that are uh, very heavily invested and committed to OpenStack as the, the future of cloud. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting and I think we uh, couldn't have a better uh, group of backers. Um, and the structure, um, I don't have a, a ton of detail on this because I don't want to. I don't want to lose you all, but uh, you can certainly spend many hours reading the bylaws if you really want to get into the nitty gritty. It's all public online at OpenStack.org/legal. But um, there's a board of directors, very similar to a um, typical corporate structure. They're the legally responsible group of folks. I mentioned kind of how that was made up earlier. The technical committee is is really there to look after the technical decisions as it relates to the project. Um, although an individual components or projects within OpenStack, such as compute or object storage, you know, those each are led by project technical leads who are elected by the contrib contributors of those projects. So they're making you know, the vast majority of the day-to-day -day decisions about those projects. The technical committee is kind of those PTLs plus a few other people that have been elected to look at technical matters that span projects. So, so when we think, or earlier I talked about the uh, the need for common authentications. That was an example of 
where it doesn't make sense to have a different authentication system for your users to log into their storage than they did for their compute. So the technical committee would be, you know, kind of the, the body of elected folks that are helping to make sure those decisions are made in a sensible way. And then last but not least, we just formed this user committee. Tim Bell from CERN, if you haven't heard him speak, he's an amazing speaker. And if you haven't followed what's going on at CERN, well then, you know, uh, you have really been uh, living under a rock because they're actually finding and creating new forms of matter. And uh, apparently, according to Tim, they're still looking for 96% of the universe uh, in terms of matter. So they've got a lot of work to do, but uh, some of the stuff they're doing with OpenStack is really fantastic. And just seeing the, the impact, something you, you might work on like OpenStack can have on the future of, you know, the way we understand the universe. I mean, I don't know. I never thought it could possibly be that impactful, you know, when we sort of kicked it off uh, three years ago. And so um, that's Tim Bell. He's leading the user committee, but there are other people that he's um, just starting to kind of pull in and the whole idea there is, again, if we don't listen to the users, then we're in trouble. And, um, you know, we want to make sure the users of the software have as strong a voice as possible. So we put this formal mechanism in place. Certainly, if you are a user and you want to get involved in this way, um, you know, talk to Tim Bell. So the staff today at the foundation, um, myself, Jonathan Bryce, Lauren Sell, uh, who many of you already know, Claire Massey just joined us this week, as a matter of fact, as a marketing coordinator. So we're very excited about that. Stefano Mafuli, the community manager. Hopefully you all know him uh, online or offline. He's always out there. He's always active. A fantastic uh, resource for the community. Terry Carez, uh, who's working on uh, the release management, of course. And if you're involved in OpenStack uh, software development anyway, I'm sure you're, you're well aware of Terry. And Jim Blair just joined us in the past week as well as an infrastructure engineer looking after some of those um, uh, infrastructure systems that we are responsible for as a foundation to try to uh, help um, facilitate how the software is developed. Now, he was already doing that job before, so like many of us who've been active in OpenStack, moving to the foundation is somewhat of a formality, but um, we're really excited about it nonetheless. And if you think it sounds exciting, check out openstack.org slash foundation jobs because we still have a number of openings. Um, it's, it's a, it's a game changing project. If you think it'd be fun to be part of a foundation working on it, um, that'll be the end of my pitch. But, uh, last but not least, Kathy Cacciatore, um, who works part-time for us, helps us with events specifically around industry events. So if you think about the many, many cloud events going on all over the globe, you know, we want OpenStack to have a presence there. And in some cases, you know, some of us from the foundation staff may attend, but in other cases, we just simply want to be a, a coordinating point to help make sure that if there are uh, stackers in a particular region where there's an event going on, there's a speaking opportunity, we connect connect that together and connect those dots. So really great to have Kathy on board. She has a lot of experience from IBM and, um, and now she's with us uh, helping on uh, those events. So uh, the priorities for the foundation really for 2013 are in a few areas. Um, adoption is always King, we're always trying to figure out what can we do to drive more adoption because at the end of the day, we want this to be ubiquitous. And, um, you know, we also want user engagement. So as we have more and more people using it, we want to, again, make sure we're hearing from them, um, getting them involved in the user committee and so forth. And, and when it comes to delivering the best cloud software, um, it's important to understand kind of how OpenStack is developed. So, you know, the foundation staff, if you look back at the previous slide, you'll notice that we don't have an army of developers. The foundation's not actually employing um, the developers that are developing the software. That's um, you know hundreds of developers that are employed by you know 50 plus companies out there. And what we're trying to do is really just facilitate that, help with the testing, with the release management. We're really trying to make sure it's a smooth um, development process. It's well documented. That we're facilitating again and that uh, it's, it's uh, reliable. We know we're producing quality software by increasing the testing coverage and so forth. And that's where people like Jim Blair and Terry Carez um, play a very important role. And it's great to have them be in the foundation so we can play our part in delivering you know, better cloud software with every release. And then uh, in terms of how we strengthen the global community, you know, we are hand, uh, hiring another community manager. Love to, to expand that team and we're also I'm hiring a business development person to really try to make sure that if our users 
really want a certain tool that maybe is a management or monitoring tool or what have you that they're used to having in their infrastructure and they want any cloud system they use to support it, well, we want to make sure those companies know about OpenStack, they're using the OpenStack APIs and really, um, you know, encouraging that, that aspect of the ecosystem to grow. So that's something we, we want to make a priority. We've done that to date, but we want to continue to do that. And so uh, what's next? On the horizon, we have the elections. So we just finished the individual member nominations. So we have candidates now. If you look on the website, you can take a look at the candidates. Um, OpenStack.org slash election has kind of the overview, the dates, and then on the right-hand side, you'll see a bunch of links, and you can look at the candidates. You can look at kind of uh, you know a number of different uh, aspects of the election and educate yourself. If you are not a member, I recommend you join, of course, but if you are a member, um, being engaged is really important. And so those elections will actually be taking place in the middle of January, the 14th through the 18th. So be prepared, get educated on that. Um, the next release of software is Grizzly. Um, personally, I'm a big fan of this name. I know it's, you know, uh, like any time you name something, some people love it, some people don't, but I think Grizzly is a pretty cool name. So Grizzly will be out in April. There are already, uh, there's already one milestone released. Uh, another one will be coming right around the corner. So if you want to get an early look at Grizzly, you can actually do that today. And, uh, and of course, the summits. So there are two summits next year. We have two every year. One will be April 2013 summit. Uh, we are a few days away from finalizing the location and the venue for that. So please uh, you know, look back on OpenStack.org soon, and you'll find more information on that. Of course, we'll be blogging and, and tweeting about it. But um, we're really uh, trying to lock that down as well as something I'm very, very excited about, which is our first ever international summit. So we're finally going to have one outside the U.S. A lot of people have asked for it. Our community definitely has hit the point of diversity geographically, where I think this makes a lot of sense. So we have not selected a location. It'll be in October. So if you have a particular region or city that you're passionate about, that you are sure is the, be the best possible place to have the OpenStack Summit, let us know. Um, you can certainly drop me a note, mark at openstack.org or Lauren Sell, Lauren at openstack.org. But um, a lot of people I know have, have strong preferences. Um, we're also looking for local contacts, whether it's a sponsor or a government agency that would like to help us um, enter that region in a big way. Um, you know, we've, we've already heard from, from some folks in, in a few of the different uh, regional offices of, of some governments that uh, that are very interested in seeing OpenStack investment in that area. So if you have contacts like that, send them my way. I want to make sure October we have a fantastic uh, first ever summit outside of the U.S. Last but not least, um, the foundation is not the only place that's hiring. If you have OpenStack skills, you can get a job today. I guarantee it. We have over a thousand jobs in the OpenStack community and you can see many of them on openstack.org slash jobs. So uh, we see so many companies hiring and on the one hand, it's exciting, but it's also something that we wanna to rise to this challenge and fill those positions with new people and by growing the community. And one of the ways to do that is through training. I think there are a number of companies that offer training. Um, as a foundation, we're starting to think about how we, we help, you know, uh, drive a more awareness around training and help develop more and more training, whether it's paid training or online training. There are a lot of different resources that I've actually been hearing more and more about different universities that are creating curriculum specifically for cloud, or in some cases they have whole courses just on OpenStack. So if you have information on that, that's another thing I'd love to hear feedback on. We want to promote more and more education so we can fill those jobs. And in a time when Jobs are scarce. We have a thousand openings, so there must be a way we can bridge this gap together. And I think OpenStack is, is a job creation engine, which you know is certainly something we, we all are excited about at this day and age. So with that, um, I'll just say thank you very much. Uh, again, I'm Mark Collier, Sparky Collier on Twitter, COO of the OpenStack Foundation. And you can always reach me on email, mark at openstack.org. Thank you so much. If you haven't joined the foundation by now, please do it, openstack.org slash join and get involved. And uh, I will see you at the next summit. Thank you.